Who was Eugene Debs? Debs, 1855-1926, was a radical labor leader who in 1893 founded the American Railway Union. ARU, an industrial union for all railroad workers. Debs was a charismatic speaker. But he was also a controversial figure in American life around the turn of the century. In 1894 workers at the Pullman Palace Car Company, which manufactured rail cars in Pullman, Illinois, near Chicago, went on strike to protest a significant reduction in their wages. Pullman was a model company town where the rail car manufacturer, founded by American inventor George W. Pullman, 1831 to 1897, in 1867, owned all the land and buildings, and ran the school, bank, and utilities. In 1893, in order to maintain profits following declining revenues, the Pullman Company cut workers' wages by 25 to 40 percent, but did not adjust rent and prices in the town, forcing many employees and their families into deprivation. In May 1894, a labor committee approached Pullman Company management to resolve the situation. The company, which had always refused to negotiate with employees, responded by firing the Labor Committee members. The firings incited a strike of all 3,300 Pullman workers. In support of the labor effort, Eugene Debs assumed leadership of the strike. Some Pullman employees had joined the ARU in 1894, and directed all ARU members not to haul any Pullman cars. A general rail strike followed, which paralyzed transportation across the country. In response to what was now being called Debs Rebellion, a July 2, 1894, federal court order, demanded all workers to return to the job, but the ARU refused to comply. U.S. President Grover Cleveland 1837-1908, ordered federal troops to break the strike, citing it interfered with mail delivery. The intervention turned violent. Despite public protest, Debs who was tried for contempt of court and conspiracy, was imprisoned in 1895 for having violated the court order. Debs later proclaimed himself a socialist and became leader of the American left. Running unsuccessfully for president as the Socialist Party candidate five times. In 1900, 1904, 1908, 1912, and 1920, he actively supported the causes of the international workers of the world. IWW, a radical labor organization founded in 1905. What was the Sioux Uprising? The uprising took place in August and September 1862 in southwestern Minnesota when the Sioux there suddenly had been made to give up half their reservation lands. Their situation was made worse by crop failures. While the government debated over whether it would make the payments it owed to Indian nations in gold or in paper currency. The Sioux were also without money. The U.S. agent at the Sioux 
reservation refused to give out any food to the Indians until their money arrived from Washington. The Sioux people were hungry and angry. And white observers could see there was trouble coming and warned the government. But the situation soon erupted in August when four young men having a shooting contest suddenly fired into a party of whites, killing five people. The Sioux refused to surrender the four men to the authorities. And, under the leadership of Chief Little Crow, c. 1820 to 1863, they raided white settlements in the Minnesota River Valley. A small U.S. military force sent out against the Sioux was annihilated. Meantime, white settlers fled the region in panic. On September 23, Minnesota sent out 1,400 men who defeated Little Crow at the Battle of Wood Lake. The raids had already claimed the lives of 490 white civilians. 33 Sioux were killed in the fighting with the military. While most of the Indians who had taken up arms fled to the Dakotas. The government began to round up native men who were suspected of participating in the campaign against white settlers. More than 300 men were tried and sentenced to death, many of them on flimsy evidence. Episcopal Bishop Henry Whipple, 1822-1901, interceded in their behalf. Making a personal plea to President Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865. The bishop was able to get 265 death sentences reduced to prison terms. But 38 Sioux men, accused of murder or rape, were hung in a public ceremony on December 26, 1862. The Sioux reservation lands were broken up, and the remaining Sioux were dispersed. Minnesotan nevertheless continued to man military posts in that part of the state for years to come. The events during and after the uprising were brutal for both sides. But many observers had seen that the treatment of the Sioux was going to lead to conflict, one missionary. After witnessing the harsh way the policy with the Indians had been carried out, wrote to Bishop Whipple. Saying, if I were an Indian I would never lay down the war club while I lived. When were antibiotics invented? The idea of antibiotics, substances that destroy or inhibit the growth of certain other microorganisms, dates back to the late 19th century. But the first antibiotics were not produced until well into the 20th century. The great French chemist Louis Pasteur, 1822-1895, laid the foundation for understanding. Antibiotics when in the late 1800s he proved that one species of microorganisms can kill another. German bacteriologist Paul Ehrlich, 1854-1915, then developed the concept of selective toxicity. In which a specific substance can be toxic, poisonous, to some organisms but harmless to others. Based on this research, scientists began working to develop substances that would destroy disease-spreading microorganisms. A breakthrough came in 1928 when Scottish bacteriologist Alexander Fleming, 1881-1955, discovered penicillin. 
Fleming observed that no bacteria grew around the mold of the genus Penicillium notatum, which had accidentally fallen into a bacterial culture in his laboratory. But penicillin proved difficult to extract. It was not until more than a decade later, in 1941, that the substance was purified and tested. By British scientist Howard Florey, 1898-1968. Another British scientist, Ernst Boris Chain, 1906-1979, developed a method of extracting penicillin. And under his supervision the first large-scale penicillin production facility was completed. Making the antibiotic commercially available in 1945. That same year, Fleming, Flory, and Chain shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their work in discovering and producing the powerful antibiotic. Still used today in the successful treatment of bacterial diseases, including pneumonia, strep throat, and gonorrhea. The term antibiotic was coined by American microbiologist Selman A. Waxman, 1888-1973, who tested about 10,000 types of soil bacteria for antibiotic capability. In 1943 Waxman discovered a fungus that produced a powerful antibiotic substance. Which he called streptomycin. The following year, the antibiotic was in production for use in treating tuberculosis, typhoid fever, bubonic plague, and bacterial meningitis. Although streptomycin was later found to be toxic, it saved countless lives and led to the discovery of many other antibiotics, which have proven both safe and effective. Why is Moby Dick considered the greatest American novel? The 1851 novel by Herman Melville, 1819-1891, which opens with the familiar line Call Me Ishmael, has been acclaimed as one of the greatest novels of all time, many regard it as the best American novel. Of course, determining the best is a purely subjective matter. And Melville's work has many worthy rivals for the distinction, but Moby Dick remains a compelling and finely wrought work in spite of the fact that it was not appreciated in its day. The story of a whaling captain's obsessive search for the whale that ripped off his leg. Moby Dick is both an exciting tale of the high seas and an interesting allegory. Interpreted as the human quest to understand the ultimately unknowable ways of God. The work first received notoriety some 30 years after Melville's death. What is the International Space Station? It is a scientific laboratory orbiting about 250 statute miles above Earth. The International Space Station, ISS, is a cooperative project among 16 nations. Led by the United States, the other partners in what is called the most complex science project in history are Russia, Canada, Japan, the 11 nations of the European Space Agency, and Brazil. When completed, the ISS will have a mass of about 1,040,000 pounds. 
will measure 356 feet across and 290 feet long and will have almost an acre of solar panels to provide electrical power to six state-of-the-art laboratories. The ISS was built through a series of missions, the first of which was the U.S. designed. Russian-built space module Zarya, Sunrise, launched November 20, 1998. The original plan called for completion. Of the ISS in 2004, but construction was extended into 2006. As of April 30, 2005, the ISS had been in orbit. And a work in progress, for 2,353 days, with a cumulative crew time in space of 1,640 days. At that time, the United States had sent 11 expeditions to the islands. It then measured 240 feet across and 146 feet long, and weighed just more than 404,000 pounds. Scientists believe that experiments conducted on the ISS will lead to discoveries in medicine and to the development of materials and new science that will benefit people around the world. The space station is also considered a monumental first step in preparing for future human space exploration. Observers can track the ISS in orbit by using tools at NASA's website, HTTP. Slash slash spaceflight.nasa.gov slash real data slash tracking slash index.html. Construction updates and a timeline can be found at the Discovery Channel website. HTTP colon slash slash www.discovery.com slash stories science slash iss slash iss html. Why is the Renaissance considered a time of rebirth? The term Renaissance is from the French word for rebirth, and the period from a. d. 1350 to 1600 in Europe was marked by the resurrection of classical Greek and Roman ideals. The flourishing of art, literature, and philosophy, and the beginning of modern science. Italians in particular believed themselves to be the true heirs to Roman achievement. For this reason, it was natural that the Renaissance began in Italy. Where the ruins of ancient civilization provided a constant reminder of their classical past and where subsequent artistic movements, such as Gothic, had never taken firm hold. What was the lasting effect of the Clarence Earl Gideon trials? A 51-year-old drifter charged with burglary in Panama City, Florida, Clarence Earl Gideon had two trials. In 1961 and 1963. But it's what happened between the two trials that is important to every American today. What might have been pretty standard fare in the day-to-day -day business of the American justice system? Gideon was charged with robbing a cigarette machine and a jukebox. The Gideon case instead made history when the defendant successfully argued that his constitutional rights had been denied when he was refused an attorney. Though he had a limited education, after a guilty verdict was handed down in his 1961 trial, 
Gideon knew enough about his rights to petition the Supreme Court. Saying that his right to a fair trial, guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment, had been violated. Since he was not able to hire a lawyer to defend himself, the trial had not been fair. The petition, one of thousands the Supreme Court receives each year, somehow rose to the top. The High Court heard Gideon's case and agreed with his conclusion, calling it an obvious truth. And clearly stating that any person hailed into court who is too poor to hire a lawyer, cannot be assured a fair trial unless counsel in provided for him. For Gideon, the opinion served to throw out the first trial, for the rest of America. It was assurance that regardless of the crime, a defendant would be guaranteed legal counsel. With the benefit of that counsel, Gideon's case was retried in 1963. He was acquitted on all charges. Why was the invention of the Reaper important to the U.S. economy? Reapers machines developed in the early 1800s to help farmers harvest grains such as wheat. Dramatically increased overall grain production and consumption in the United States and the rest of the world. The first commercially successful reaper was built in 1831 by Virginia-born inventor Cyrus Hall McCormick. 1809-1884 who patented it in 1834 and first sold it in 1840 in Virginia. The McCormick Reaper was horse-drawn and replaced the use of sickles and scythes in the fields. It also reduced the amount of manual labor required to harvest grain crops. It worked in this way, a straight blade, protected by guards, was linked to a drive wheel. As the drive wheel turned, the blade moved back and forth in a sawing motion. Cutting through the stalks of grain, which were held straight by rods. The cut grain stalks then fell onto a platform and were collected with a rake by a worker. The device increased average production from 2 or 3 acres a day to 10 acres a day. McCormick's Reaper was soon in wide use, and the inventor was on his way to becoming an industrialist. In 1847 he moved his business to Chicago, where he could transport Reapers via the Great Lakes and connected waterways to the east and to the south. Within five years McCormick's business had become the largest farm implement factory in the world. Sales and distribution of the equipment increased further during the 1850s. As Chicago became a center for the nation's then expanding rail system. In 1879 Cyrus McCormick's business became the McCormick Harvesting Machine Company. With the inventor himself as president, until 1884, when he was succeeded by his son. The Reaper was improved over time, in the 1850s a self-raking feature was added. Further reducing the amount of labor required to harvest grain, in the 1870s a binder was added. Which bound the sheaves of grain and dropped them to the ground to be collected. In the 1920s the Reaper, or Harvester, was joined with another invention. The thresher, which separates grains from the stalks. The new Reaper thresher machine was called a combine. 
Today's combines still use the basic features present in McCormick's revolutionary 1831 invention. His company later became International Harvester, 1902, and today is known as Navy Star Corporation. Did Marie Antoinette really say, let them eat cake? No, the widely quoted phrase was incorrectly attributed to her, and the entire story was probably made up. Nevertheless, the legend is not far from fact, as the daughter of a holy Roman emperor. Francis I, the beautiful Marie Antoinette, 1755-1793, was accustomed to a life of luxury. Unhappy in her marriage to Louis XVI, 1754-1793, King of France. She pursued her own pleasurable interests with abandon. Despite the economic problems that plagued France at the time, she lived an extravagant lifestyle. Which included grand balls, a small palace at Versailles, theatre, gambling, and other frivolities. She was completely disinterested in the affairs of the nation. Many French people blamed her for corruption in the court. In short, she did much to earn herself the terrible reputation that has followed her through history. Unpopular in her own day, one of the stories that circulated about her. Had Marie Antoinette asking an official why the Parisians were angry. When he explained to the Queen that it was because the people had no bread. She replied, then let them eat cake. The French Revolution, which began in 1789, soon put an end to Marie Antoinette's excesses. Along with her husband, she was put to death by guillotine in 1793. When did the exploration of space begin? The space age began on October 4, 1957, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. Later referred to as Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite. The world reacted to the news of Sputnik, which took pictures of the far side of the moon, with a mix of shock and respect. Premier Nikita Khrushchev, 1894-1971 Of the Soviet Union immediately approved funding for follow-up projects. And leaders in the West, not to be outdone by the Soviets in exploring the last frontier. Also vowed to support space programs. Four months later, the United States launched its first satellite. Explorer 1, on January 31, 1958. Not only had the launch of Sputnik initiated the space age, it had also started a space race, the Soviet and American programs would continue to rival each other. With one accomplishment leapfrogging the other, for about the next three decades. What is behaviorism?
Behaviorism is a school of psychology that attempts to explain human behavior in terms of responses to environmental stimuli. Influenced by the conditioned reflex demonstrated by Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov. 1849-1936, American psychologist John Broadus Watson, 1878-1958, of Johns Hopkins University. Codified and popularized the theory, which discards introspection and consciousness as influences on human behavior. Behaviorism was further studied by another American psychologist and Harvard professor B. F. Skinner. 1904-1990, Skinner focused his work on patterns of responses to observable stimuli, versus unobservable stimuli such as introspection and conscience, and external rewards. Applied to human learning, Skinner's theories on behaviorism affected educational methods, which tangibly reward good behavior. Who was more important to rock and roll Elvis Presley or the Beatles? While music historians and fans of either or both may be willing to offer an opinion, the question cannot be definitively answered. The fact is that popular music today would not be what it is had it not been for both Elvis Presley and the Beatles. And the influences of both are still felt. Elvis Presley, 1935-1977, brought to music an exciting and fresh combination of country, gospel, blues, and rhythm and blues music, and topped it all off with a style and sense of showmanship that dazzled young audiences. His first commercial recording was That's All Right, Mama in 1954 which was followed in 1956 by the success of Heartbreak Hotel. Between 1956 and 1969 he had 17 number one records. Presley defined a new musical style and an era. Among those the American Presley had influenced were four English musicians who called themselves the Beatles. Originally founded as the Quarrymen by John Lennon, 1940-1980, in 1956. The group became the most popular rock and roll band of the 1960s. Their first single was Love Me Do, released on October 5, 1962, and producer George. Martin was encouraged that the Beatles could produce a number one record. In 1963 they did. Please Please Me was released in Britain on January 12th and was an immediate hit. Other hits off their first album included She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand. The follow-up album, With the Beatles was released in 1964 and established them as Britain's favorite group. Already popular in their homeland, Beatlemania began in the United States on February 7, 1964, when the mop top Fab Four, Lennon along with Paul McCartney, B. 1942, George Harrison, 1943 to 2001 and Ringo Starr B 1940 arrived at New York's Kennedy International Airport and were met by a mob of more than 10 000 screaming fans and 110 police officers 
Two days later, on February 9, the Beatles made their legendary appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. By April the group held on to the top five positions on the U.S. singles charts. The British invasion had begun. In their early years, the Beatles brought a new energy to rock. And roll and picked up where Presley, Buddy Holly, and Little Richard had left off. The instrumentation and orchestration of Beatles songs, for which their producer George Martin deserves at least some of the credit, were innovative at the time, and are common for rock music today. Their rock movies, A Hard Day's Night, 1964, and Help, 1965, were a precursor to the music videos of today. When the band decided to break up, the April 10, 1970, announcement proved to be the end of an era. What is the Doomsday Clock? The clock represents the threat of nuclear annihilation. It was created by the board of directors of Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and first appeared on the cover of that magazine in 1947 two years after the United States had used two nuclear weapons against Japan. At Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to end World War II, 1939 to 45. The atomic scientists developed the idea in order to illustrate the threat of total destruction posed by nuclear weapons. On the clock, midnight is the time of destruction. When the clock first appeared, the scientists had set the time at seven minutes before midnight. In the decades since, the clock had been adjusted based on the proliferation of or agreements to limit nuclear weapons. The closest it ever came to doomsday was two minutes until midnight. This was in 1953, shortly after the United States and the Soviet Union each tested hydrogen bombs. The farthest the minute hand has ever been from striking the hour of midnight was in 1991, when the United States and the Soviet Union signed the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. Start, and announced cuts in nuclear weapons. The scientists moved the clock to read 17 minutes until midnight. In the late 1990s the clock read 14 minutes to midnight. But the 1998 testing of nuclear weapons in Pakistan and India, neighboring countries long at odds with each other, resulted in the clock being forwarded to 9 minutes before midnight. In 2002 the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists informed the world that the clock had been adjusted to 7 minutes to midnight, saying that not only had little progress been made on global nuclear disarmament, but the United States had rejected a series of arms control treaties and announced that it would withdraw from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Further, terrorists sought to acquire and use nuclear and biological weapons. All of this added up to a greater threat of nuclear annihilation. When was Hollywood's golden age? Hollywood had its heyday in the 1930s, 
in the same decade that the Great Depression crippled the world economy. The American film industry enjoyed its golden age. The era was marked by technical innovations, talking movies had made their debut in 1927 with the first full-length film with sound, The Jazz Singer, and by 1932 all films were talkies. The first Technicolor film, Becky Sharp, debuted in 1935, and by 1939 was perfected when Gone with the Wind was released. And special effects were brought to the screen in 1933 with King Kong. Which was the result of painstaking stop motion and rear projection photography. In the meantime, movie stars such as Clark Gable, Claudette Colbert, Greta Garbo, and the Marx Brothers achieved public followings that were the envy of political and business leaders. The MGM, Warner Brothers, and RKO Studios led Hollywood production, but other studios, including Fox, Paramount, Universal, Columbia, and United Artists, also fared well during these difficult times. In 1939 Hollywood had what has often been called its greatest year. Among the top releases that year were the classics Gone with the Wind, The Wizard of Oz, Stagecoach, Ninochka, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and Gunga Din. By the end of the decade Hollywood had become a major contributor to popular culture. An occasional contributor to high culture, and a dynamic, if unsteady, force in the nation's economy. How old was Mozart when he composed his first work? A child prodigy, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, 1756-1791, was composing at the age of five. He had been playing the harpsichord since the age of three. His father, Leopold, 1719-1787, was a composer and violinist who recognized his son's unusual music ability and encouraged and taught young Mozart. In 1762 Leopold took his son and daughter, Maria Anna, nicknamed Nannerl, 1751-1829, on tour to Paris. While there, young Wolfgang Mozart composed his first published violin sonatas and improvisations. However, the image of the effortless and artless child of nature is not altogether true. Contrary to the reports that the gifted composer never revised first and only drafts, he did work at his craft. In a letter to his father, he wrote, It is a mistake to think that the practice of my art has Become easy to me no one has given so much care to the study of composition as I have. There is scarcely a famous master in music whose works I have not frequently and diligently studied. The fact is that he did make revisions to his works. Though it is also true that he composed at a rapid pace. The result is an impressive body of works, unequaled in beauty and diversity. The complete output some 600 works in every form, symphonies, sonatas, operas, operettas, cantatas, arias, duets, and others, would be enough to fill almost 200 CDs. Among his most cherished works are The Marriage of Figaro, 
1786. Don Giovanni, 1787, Cosi Fan Tutte, 1790, and the Magic Flute, 1791. How did Mother Teresa begin her life's work? Born Agnes Gonka Bohakio in August 1910 in Skopje, in present-day Macedonia. The woman the world knew as Mother Teresa had by age 12 realized that she would spend her life aiding the poor. At age 18 she left her family to pursue that mission. Joining a community of Irish nuns who were missionaries in Calcutta, India. There she took the name Sister Teresa and began teaching at St. Mary's High School, which she would continue to do for the next 17 years. She took her final vows as a nun in 1937. In 1946 she became ill and was believed to have contracted tuberculosis. Sent to Darjeeling in northeast India to recover, she was on a train when she heard the call to give up all and follow him to the slums to serve him among the poorest of the poor. In 1948 Pope Pius XII, 1876 to 1958, allowed Sister Teresa to leave her order and pursue this mission. In 1950, after receiving some medical training. She founded the Order of Missionaries of Charity in Calcutta. Two years later she opened a home for the dying poor, it was called Nirmal Hrida Your Pure Heart. One year after that she opened her first orphanage. It was the children there who called her Mother Teresa, or sometimes simply Mother. She spent her life helping the sick and the outcast, who she described as Christ in distressing disguise. Small in stature, she was frail and in poor health in her final years. But she continued her work nevertheless. It was not until March 1997, just months before her death, that she finally stepped down as head of her order. Having started with only 12 members, the missionaries of charity had grown to include more than four. 000 nuns who continued to run orphanages and hospices around the world. Mother Teresa died on September 5th of that year. She was 87. What were the harshest blizzards to hit the United States? Regions of the United States particularly the Great Plains, Midwest and New England typically experience extreme winter weather, but some storms do stand out. In March 1888 the Northeast was hit by a blizzard dubbed the Great White Hurricane. After a warm spell that had caused the buds to open on trees in New York's Central Park. On March 12 the temperature in the city plummeted to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, and winds off the Atlantic built up to 48 miles per hour. Bringing unpredicted snow that continued intermittently until the early morning of March. 14 The three day accumulation totaled 20.9 inches, and snow drifts 15 to 20 feet high halted traffic. The snowfall was even greater elsewhere. 
averaging 40 inches or more in parts of southeastern New York and southern New England. The storm extended down into Chesapeake Bay. Isolating the nation's capital from the world for more than a day. 200 ships were lost or grounded, and at least 100 died at sea. A total of at least 400 people died, half of them in New York City alone. Just two months before this nor'easter, another blizzard had swept through the Great Plains, moving eastward into Minnesota. There, high winds, blowing snow, and sudden drops in temperature combined to make it a dangerous storm. Killing many people and thousands of cattle. The Great Blizzard of 1993 caused loss of life and extensive damage all along the eastern seaboard, from Maine to Florida. More than 300 people died, almost 50 of them at sea, and economic losses totaled $3 to $6 billion. While several so-called 100-year storms have bombarded the East Coast in the 1990s alone. There had been another just a few months earlier, in December 1992. The statistics of the March 1993 storm are impressive indeed, probably qualifying it as the storm of the century. Wind gusts exceeded 75 miles per hour all along the east coast. With winds exceeding 100 miles per hour were measured at various points, including Flattop, North Carolina. Tennessee saw the highest snowfall of the storm, with 56 inches at Mount Leconte. Snowfall amounts were also heavy in the northeast but snow accumulated as far south as the Florida Panhandle. Experts estimated that the amount of water that fell, in the form of snow, was equivalent to 40 days flow of the mighty Mississippi River past New Orleans. According to record low barometer readings, this storm surpassed Hurricanes Hugo, 1989, and Hazel, 1954. However, Midwesterners and residents of the northern Great Plains could argue that storms such as the Great Blizzard of 1993 are relatively common in their regions. To wit, another storm that could easily be for the tidal storm of the century occurred January 10-11, 1975. In the Upper Midwest the blizzard was accompanied by winds of 90 miles per hour and wind chills as low as minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Trains were stranded in snowdrifts, and at least 80 people died. Ranchers and farmers were hard hit, losing some 55,000 head of livestock. What is Title IX? Considered one of the biggest successes of the modern women's movement. Title IX is part of the Education Amendments of 1972, federal legislation that prohibits any school or college that receives federal funds from discriminating on the basis of sex. The law applies to all aspect of education, including admission, athletics, and curriculum. What was Nietzsche's philosophy about the will to power?
the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. 1844-1900, developed many theories of human behavior, and the will to power was one of these. While other philosophers, including the ancient Greek Epicurus, argued that humans are motivated by a desire to experience pleasure, Nietzsche asserted that it was neither pleasure nor the avoidance of pain that inspires humankind, but rather the desire for strength and power. He argued that in order to gain power, humans would even be willing to embrace pain. However, it's critical to note that he did not view this will to power strictly as a will to dominate others. Nietzsche glorified a superman or overman. Ubermensch, an individual who could assert power over himself, or herself. He viewed artists as one example of an overman since that person successfully harnesses his or her instincts through creativity and in so doing has actually achieved a higher form of power than would the person who only wishes to dominate others. A notable exception to Nietzsche's esteem for artists was the composer Richard Wagner. 1813-1883, whom the philosopher opposed. Since Wagner led an immoral lifestyle, unlike the Ubermensch, Nietzsche maintained that the composer had not gained power over his own instincts. Nietzsche was a professor of classics at the University of Basel in Switzerland from 1868 to 1878. Retiring due to poor health, he turned to his writing, which included poetry. In 1889 he suffered a mental breakdown and died the next year. After his death, his sister, Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche, 1846-1935, altered her brother's works in editing, changing their meaning. In 1895 she married an anti-Semitic agitator, Bernhard Forster, 1843-1889, who, with his wife, attempted to establish a pure Aryan, a non-Jewish Caucasian, colony in Paraguay. The effort failed, and Forster took his own life. These events and, more importantly, the changes to the philosopher's own words resulted in the popular misconception that Nietzsche's philosophies had given rise to Nazism. So much art is called Impressionistic today what exactly is Impressionism? The term Impressionism was derived by a rather mean-spirited art critic from the title of one of Claude Monet's 1840-1926, Early Paintings, Impression, Fog, La Havre, 1872. The French Impressionist painters were interested in the experience of the natural world and in rendering it exactly as it is seen not fixed and frozen with an absolute perspective, but rather as constantly changing and as it is glimpsed by a moving eye. George Isra, 1859-1891, and Paul Signac, 1863-1935, are also typically thought of as Impressionists. However, they are more appropriately dubbed Neo-Impressionists since they along with Camille Pissarro, 1830-1903, to 
advance the work of the original group through more. Scientific theories of light and color, introducing deliberate optical effects to their works. Seurat and Signac are commonly referred to as Pontiists for the technique. Pioneered by Seurat, of using small brush strokes to create an intricate mosaic effect. The post-impressionists, artists representing a range of explorations but all having come out of the impressionist movement. Included both Seurat and Signac, as well as Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. 1864-1901, Paul Gauguin, 1848-1903, Vincent van Gogh, 1853-1890. And Paul Cezanne, 1839-1906, who was also associated with the original Impressionists. Together the Impressionists paved the way for the art of the 20th century. Since as a group they asserted the identity of a painting as a thing, a created object in its own right. With its own structure and its own laws beyond and different from, the world of man and nature, history of modern art. What was the philosophy of the Middle Ages? During medieval times, 500-1350, philosophers concerned themselves with applying the works of ancient Greek thinkers, such as Aristotle, 384-322b, c, and Plato, c 428-347 BC, to Christian thought. This movement which spanned most of the Middle Ages and reached its high water mark in the 13th century. Was called scholasticism since its proponents were often associated with universities. The word scholastic is derived from the Greek scholastikos, meaning to keep a school. In the simplest terms, the goal of scholasticism has been described as the Christianization of Aristotle. Indeed, medieval philosophers strive to use reason to better understand faith. Scholasticism was, therefore, both rational and religious. The movement was also an interesting occasion of East meets West. The commentaries of Islamic philosophers, principally Ibn Nasr, c. 878 to 950, Averroes, 1126 to 1198, and Avicenna, 9801037, figured prominently in scholasticism. Theologians, including Saint Anselm and Saint Thomas Aquinas, used the non Christian philosophy both of the ancient Greeks and of Muslim thinkers to better understand their own Christian faith. Why was Susan B. Anthony tried? Susan B. Anthony, 1820-1896, was tried for violating federal voting laws. The suffrage movement was in full swing in 1872 when Anthony and 14 female companions went to the Rochester, New York, voter registration office and demanded to be registered. When the officials refused, Anthony argued with them, showing them the written opinion of a judge Henry R. Selden, 
who agreed with her, and others, that the Fourteenth Amendment. 1868, also protects women's rights, including the right to vote. She threatened the registrars that she would sue them. If they did not allow her to participate in elections. They gave in and the women signed up to vote. On election day, November 5th, they did just that. 23 days later, all 15 women were arrested for having done so. Bail was set, and eventually all the women were released. The following June, Anthony's trial got underway. The U.S. District Attorney presented the government's case against her. She had upon the fifth day of November. 1872, voted. At which time she was a woman. She was found guilty and ordered to pay a fine of $100. In another act of civil disobedience. Anthony refused to pay it, saying, Resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. In the coming years, the nation's courts continued to narrowly interpret the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, to the exclusion of women. Anthony died 24 years before American women were granted suffrage. After the 19th Amendment was made in 1920, When did football begin? In ancient Greece and Rome, a game was played in which the object was to move a ball across a goal line by throwing, kicking, or running with it. Several modern games were derived from this, including rugby and soccer from which American football directly evolved, in much of the world football refers to soccer, in which players are allowed to advance the ball only with their feet or heads. Historians generally agree that the first game of American football was played on November 6, 1869, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, when Rutgers defeated the College of New Jersey, present-day Princeton University. 6-4. They played on a field 120 yards long and 75 yards wide and used a round, soccer-like ball. Other Eastern colleges, including Columbia, Harvard, and Yale, soon added the sport to their athletic programs. In 1876 a set of official rules were compiled. In the 1880s Yale coach Walter Camp, 1859-1925, revised the rules, giving the world the game played today. He limited teams to 11 players, established the scrimmage system for putting the ball into play. Introduced the concept of requiring a team to advance the ball a certain number of yards within a given number of downs and came up with the idea of marking the field with yard lines. Who were the Saxons? Saxons were a Germanic people who in the second century lived in southern Jutland. In the area of present day Denmark and northwestern Germany. During the next two centuries, the Saxons raided the coastal areas of the North Sea. By about 400, they had reached northern Gaul, 
the ancient country that occupied the area west and south of the Rhine River. West of the Alps, and north of the Pyrenees Mountains. Roughly modern-day France, Belgium, Luxembourg, part of Germany, and part of the Netherlands. By about 450, as Roman rule was declining, the Saxons had reached England. Where they merged with the Angles and began setting up Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. The Anglo-Saxons dominated. England until it was conquered by Danish Vikings, under the leadership of Canute, in 1016. Who was Florence Nightingale? The English nurse, hospital reformer, and philanthropist is considered the founder of modern nursing. The daughter of well-to-do British parents, Florence Nightingale, 1820-1910, was born in Florence, Italy. Though she was raised in privilege on her family's estate in England. Nightingale had a natural and irrepressible inclination toward caring for others. Despite her parents' wishes, Nightingale who, in accordance with the social standards of her set and day had already been presented to the Queen entered a training program for nurses near Dusseldorf, Germany. She went on to study in Paris. In 1853 Nightingale became superintendent of a hospital for invalid women in London. In 1854 Nightingale took 38 nurses with her to the city of Uskudar, near Istanbul, Turkey. There, despite great obstacles, she set up a barrack hospital to treat soldiers who were injured in the Crimean War. 1853-56, then being fought between Russian forces and the Allied armies of Britain. France, the Ottoman Empire, present-day Turkey, and Sardinia, part of present-day Italy. Nightingale set about cleaning the filthy hospital facility. Established strict schedules for the staff, and introduced sanitation methods that reduced the spread of infectious diseases such as cholera, typhus, and dysentery. While her methods were considered controversial at first, doctors initially found Nightingale to be demanding and pushy, they got results. Before long, Nightingale was put in charge of all the Allied Army hospitals in the Crimea. During the fighting Nightingale visited the front and caught Crimean fever, which threatened her life. By this time she had become so well known that Queen Victoria 1819-1901 was aware of and deeply concerned about Nightingale's illness. By the end of the war, Nightingale's care of the sick and wounded was legendary. Known for walking the floor of the hospital at night, tending her patients, she became known as the Lady with the Lamp. After the war Nightingale returned to London and in 1860, with 50,000 pounds sterling. She established a training institution for nurses in London. In 1873 Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Bellevue Hospital in New York City, and New Haven Hospital in Connecticut opened the United States' first nursing schools. All of them were patterned after the London program founded by Nightingale. Nightingale's fierce determination, 
which ran contrary to her parents' wishes. For her as well as to the social standard of the day, made her a legend. And rightly so, because of her concern for the sick, the standard of care of all patients improved. Which was the first TV network? It was the National Broadcasting Company, NBC, founded November 11, 1926, by David Sarnoff. 1891-1971 who was then president of Radio Corporation of America, RCA. Sarnoff, considered one of the pioneers of radio and television broadcasting. Created NBC to provide a program service to stimulate the sale of radios. In the 1940s he reorganized the network to provide TV programming. Again to stimulate sales of RCA products this time, televisions. It was Sarnoff who demonstrated television at the World's Fair in New York in 1939. Next came Columbia Broadcasting System. CBS, on September 26, 1928, which was established by William S. Paley. 1901-1990, an advertising manager for Congress Cigar Company. Paley sold some of his stock in the cigar company in order to raise $275,000 to buy into the beleaguered United Independent Broadcasters, which controlled Columbia Phonograph, hence the name. He built the floundering radio network into a powerful and profitable broadcasting organization. The American Broadcasting Corporation, ABC, television network was last. In 1943, it was only by government order that the third network, ABC, was created at all. In 1943, when RCA was ordered to give up one of its two radio networks. It surrendered the weaker of the two, NBC Blue, which was bought by Edward J. Noble, the father of Lifesavers Candy. In 1945 Noble formally changed the name to the American Broadcasting Company which three years later began broadcasting television from its New York flagship station. What was the Peloponnesian War? It was the war fought between the Greek city-states of Athens and Sparta between 431 and 404 B.C. It left Athens ruined. The beginning of the war signaled the end of the Golden Age of Greece. As the city-states, which were self-ruling regions made up of a city and the surrounding territory, developed, an intense rivalry grew between Athens and Sparta. The Spartans recruited allies into the Peloponnesian League, the Peloponnese Peninsula forms the southern part of mainland Greece. And together they attacked the Athenian Empire, which had been gaining in power. The war consisted of three stages, the first was the Archidamian War, 431 to 421 BC. Named for Archidamus, the Spartan king who led the unsuccessful attacks on fortified Athens. In 421 the so-called Peace of Nicias, 421 to 413 BC. 
began, which was negotiated by Athenian politician Nicias. But this truce was broken when an Athenian commander promoted counter-attacks on Athens's. Aggressors in 418 and 415 BC. The attacks on the Peloponnesian League were unsuccessful. And so the Ionian War broke out, 413 to 404 BC. After years of fighting. The Ionian War finally ended in victory for Sparta, after the Peloponnesian League had not only gained the support of Persia to defeat Athens but had successfully encouraged Athens's own subjects to revolt. Athens surrendered to Sparta, ending the Peloponnesian War. What was the May 4th movement? It was a mass movement that emerged in China after May 4, 1919, when students in Beijing protested one of the outcomes of the peace conference held at Versailles. Earlier that year to officially settle World War I, 1914-18 Japan, which had seized German territories in China during the war, was given control of the holdings. Student demonstrators criticized a weakened Chinese government for allowing the Japanese occupation. Following the death of powerful leader Yuan Shikai, 1859-1916. The country's central government crumbled, in northern China local military leaders, called warlords. Rose to power, continually challenging the authority of the capital at Beijing. Meanwhile, revolutionary leader Sun Yat-sen 1866-1925, had begun promoting his three great principles nationalism, democracy, and people's livelihood in southern China. Where he gained the support of military leaders in the region. At about the same time, Chinese intellectuals had begun attacking traditional culture and society. Urging government reforms and the modernization of industry. The May 4th movement fanned the fires of revolution. The movement would have far-reaching and unforeseen results. And some might argue that the story has not yet played out. In 1919 Sun reorganized the Kuomintang, Nationalist, Party and began recruiting student followers. Two years later he became president of a self-proclaimed national government of the Southern Chinese Republic. Establishing the capital at Guangzhou, Canton. His sights were set on conquering northern China. Toppling the northern warlords to reunify the country. In 1924 Sun began cooperating with both the Soviets and the communist groups that had been formed by students following. The 1919 protest. Under Sun's leadership, the Nationalist Party began preparing for war. But Sun, who is regarded as the father of modern China, would not live to see the culmination of his plans. He died of cancer in 1925. Under military leader Chiang Kai-shek, 1887-1975. The Kuomintang turned on its communist members, whose leaders fled in fear of the Generalissimo. In 1928, following a two-year military campaign, Chang led the nationalists to capture Beijing. Reuniting China under one government for the first time in 12 years. 
his rule of China lasted until 1949, when communists won control of the mainland and Mao Zedong. 1893 to 1976, became the first chairman of the People's Republic of China. The expelled Chang and his followers established a Chinese nationalist government on the island of Taiwan. Back on the mainland, Mao's great leap forward, his massive collectivization of agriculture and industry. Brought economic failure and a two-year famine to China in the late 1950s.